If I could have your attention, please, if you're willing and able, would you be so kind as stand for the invocation? And I'd like to present to you uh, Dr. Olin McBride, the pastor of the McDonough Presbyterian Church in McDonough. Doctor. Thank you. May we pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks for, for this day. We thank you for this, this wonderful morning. We thank you also that summer, the hot summer is perhaps almost gone, and we look forward to fall season cooler weather and football season of course we pray that you will be with us as we deliberate as we talk about our wonderful county as we talk about what needs to be done and may we always do so mindful of the great citizens of this community we pray these things in Jesus name amen amen I pledge you the flag I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands one nation under God and the indivisible with With the Henry County Board of Commissioners, 9 a.m. Tuesday, September 1st, 2015, meeting come to order. Does somebody move uh, that we accept the agenda as published for this meeting? So moved. Have a motion, District 5? Second. Second District 3, any further discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign, so move. Public comments. Citizens are allowed to voice county-related concerns, opinions, etc., that are not listed on the agenda during this portion of the meeting. All persons wish to speak for public comments must sign in with the county clerk prior to the beginning of the meeting. You must complete the public comment speaker form or you will not be recognized. You will be able to address the board for five minutes. Uh, I take these in order that they would file. First one is Mr. Steve Richardson. Uh, if you would come forth, you get five minutes. You want to talk about corruption. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Steve Richardson, 207 Wind Drive in Hampton, Georgia. Commissioners, you were made aware of a public act of corruption here in Henry County almost two weeks ago. Yet you have taken no steps to either investigate, suspend, or terminate the employees responsible. This corruption involves four county employees. They are Department of Elections employee Shay Mathis, Budget Director Angie Shoro, Human Resources Director Nedra Swift, and Interim County Manager Sherry Matthews. I have in my possession two personnel action forms I have received through open records process that spells out these facts. Can you turn around, please? Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. As County Clerk, Shay Mathis was earning $69,190 annually. But the Board of Commissioners voted on February 3rd, 2015 to move Ms. Mathis from County Clerk to Election Filing Clerk at the Department of Elections. It was voted to reduce her salary to $53,098. The move in salary change was effective March 16th, 2015. The personnel action form was signed by Chairman Smith and then County Manager Jim Walker. On May 27th, 2015, Excuse me. HR Director Nedra Smith and Interim County Sherry Matthews, as constant urging of Shea Mathis, reversed the Board of Commissioners' decision without its approval and returned Ms. Mathis' salary back to $69,130. They also approved retroactive pay from Ms. Mathis to March 16th in an amount of $3,094. Now Ms. Mathis is making several thousand dollars more per year at her elections than her elections director, Ms. Lunsford. And Ms. Lunsford, who supervises Ms. Was Ms. Supervisors Ms. Mathis was not even aware or consulted about any of this. Furthermore, no county commissioner or the director of elections signed the personnel action form requesting a reversal of Ms. Mathis' pay. 
These women conspired to do a private backdoor deal to take care of one of their friends, and it cost the taxpayers just under $20,000. Why wasn't the Board of Commissioners taking any action when Nedra Smith told you two weeks ago that she and Sherry Matthews were responsible for reversing Ms. Mathis' pay without your knowledge? <clears throat> I also believe Budget Director Angie Shoro is part of the corruption. She moved money into the Elections Department financial account to cover the backdoor pay raise as she knew the pay raise happened and didn't notify anybody, not the Board of Commissioners or Ms. Lunsford. As a person who keeps track of the county's money and as former Human Resources Director, she knew this was wrong and she hid it from the Board of Commissioners and the public. What else has Ms. Sora done with the money that the county doesn't know about? None of these four women can be trusted. What else have they done with our money that the people don't know about? They have stolen from the county and the taxpayers without our knowledge and, have, and you have taken no action whatsoever. How can that be? I will tell you how, Mr. Chairman. You have remained silent in our, in our protecting Shay Mathis because she was helping you it went <clears throat> spy on your fellow commissioners and other employees when she was the open records clerk. Ms. Mathis had access to every county's county email and she routinely gave you secret access to employee emails so you could learn what they were doing. Then you would contact your supporters, Mr. Tony and Mr. Jennifer Rosenbaum and the media and give them specific instructions on who and which emails to formally request through the open records process. Ms. Mathis got caught through the open, Ms. Mathis got caught lying to one of the commissioners when she was asked how you were getting the emails. And, why, and that's why she was removed from county clerk. In fact, you're the only commissioner who voted not to remove Ms. Mathis as county clerk. You were part of this cover-up because you don't want your dishonesties to be exposed. Commissioners, stop playing games and stop the corruption in Henry County. You are elected to protect the citizens and our tax dollars. Do your job. Terminate these four women and investigate Chairman Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll have Mr. Bill Tony. Uh, issue Lake Down. Okay, I think uh, uh, Bill Tony, 1652 Highway 155, McDonough, Georgia. This right here, we, we've had issues over at Lake Dow with a dam. Uh, it's a private lake. Uh, I know, Gary, you made, you made promises here that, and it says, well, let me put this up. It says that if they elect you, your problem is fixed. They'll get their dam fixed, basically. I'm assuming that's what this is all about. Now, it's a private lake, Lake Dow. If I want to go over there and take my grandson fishing, if I want to do anything over there, I'm not allowed to. There's no reason for the county to get involved in that. They had the same issues over at Lake Spivey, the homeowners, put up the money, they repaired the dam, everything's done. Now these folks at Lake Dow, they're asking the county to get involved. In fact, we've already put 28, over $28,000 into this deal. And they're willing, they were willing, to pay for the 28,000. Now they didn't understand why we didn't take their money. But we put up our own money, the $28,000. Now I've looked at the whole situation over there and it's really, no more if per household than putting a roof on a house. That's basically what it boils down to. Is, and so I don't think that the county, unless, unless they want to open up Lake Dow to the public, the taxpayers, to go use their facility, I don't think that, uh, that we should get involved down there. Now, this right here, when Gary sent out this letter, he pretty well guaranteed it. I'm going to ask every one of you guys to vote no on this thing going any further with it because we should not be involved in somebody's private 
property issues. That's not what we, that's not what we do. In fact, might need to look at the people that built the dam to start with and take a look and see what, what kind of legals they, they're responsible for for putting something in that's faulty. And um, just kind of take a look at that. Um, we're, if I, if I had a, a dam on my property, I'm sure y'all wouldn't be over there fixing it. I'd be responsible for my own deal. So I would respectfully ask every one of you guys to vote no when it comes up, let them take it. We shouldn't be involved over there. Let them have it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, having no more uh, sheets here, I conclude that the public uh, comment segment is completed and over. Consent agenda. The final agenda item shall be considered on the consent agenda. Before voting on the consent agenda item, the chairman will provide opportunity to add or delete. So we have uh, two items. Resolution accepting the supplementary grant from the State of Georgia Office of Government Criminal Justice Coordinating Council Fiscal Year 2016. Also public safety resolution approving a lease agreement between Henry County Police Department and DDRM Shop of Ellingwood for the Ellingwood uh, Fairview Police uh, Department precinct. Uh, that's the only two items I have on the consent. Does anybody want to add to or delete this? If uh, so, raise your hand. If not, will somebody move? We accept the consent agenda as published. So moved. Have a motion, District 5. Uh, second from District 3. Any further discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. So moved. Under the Splash uh, Department, we have a resolution approving the transmittal of a feasibility study for the new interchange under State 75 in Henry County for the Georgia Department of Transportation. Rocky Romero, and I understand we have some guests that you're going to introduce. Yes, sir, uh, Chairman. Good morning, and good morning, Commissioners. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge a few people in the audience uh, that participated as stakeholders in the meetings uh, we held uh, regarding the feasibility study. Uh, first, uh, Keith Dickerson with the City of McDonough. Also, Steve Cash with the Henry, Quality, Henry Council for Quality Growth. Also, Terry McMichael with Henry County DOT. Uh, we also have uh, Kimley Horn, engineers in, in charge of the feasibility study, and uh, the Jonathan Guy and uh, Gary Newton. Both uh, City of Locust Grove and the City of McDonough have approved and endorsed uh, the feasibility study to be submitted to Georgia DOT. Um, I will read the resolution, and then Jonathan Guy will, with Kimley Horn will provide an overview uh, feasibility study with an uh, overhead PowerPoint presentation. Uh, Henry County, as, as part of the special purpose local option sales tax plus four program, contracted with Kimley Horn to develop a feasibility study for a new interchange along I-75 between exit 216 in McDonough and exit 212 in the city of Locust Grove, as prepared and shown on Exhibit A. The feasibility study is the first step towards achieving approval of a new interchange along I-75. Staff recommends approval to submit the feasibility study for the new interchange along I-75 between exit 216 in McDonough and exit 212 in the city of Locust Grove to the Georgia Department of Transportation as means for improvement of mobility, safety, and to maintain economic prosperity between the two overburdened interchanges. Um, now we're gonna take about 10 minutes and Jonathan is gonna explain uh, a little bit more about the feasibility and uh, the next steps um, that will take uh, for us to go pursuing this uh, new interchange. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, again, as Rocky said, uh, it's been a pleasure working on this project. I'm gonna take about 10 minutes and just sort of give you a quick overview of what we've done and steps moving forward. Um, as you can see up here, in working with the uh, Atlanta Regional Commission as well as the Georgia Department of Transportation, they recommended three interchanges for our evaluation. Um, looking back at exits 218, 216, and 212, 
We studied the impacts, what's going on. Uh, out of all the interchanges, exit 216 has the, the worst congestion, as you well know, if you live here and operate, uh, which is the basis for our feasibility study. Um, the feasibility study started looking at not just traffic, though, but also looked at the environmental constraints, understanding what's out there, any historic properties, any churches in the area, which there are a few churches. Uh, one significant church there on Bethlehem Road we needed to take a look at, as well as the uh, conditions, the environmental conditions there, as you can see um, on the map up here. Um, significant wetlands as well as floodplains and flood zones through the area that we needed to be cognizant of as we started to connect this. Because one of the criteria that the Federal Highway Administration has is that any new interchange cannot be for just a private access point. It also must connect to the public's network. There's eight criteria that we needed to look at. You can see those up there. Um, the first one being the need that the need for access cannot be met by the existing interstate interchanges. If you've driven through exit 216, you know that it's not doing its job today. Um, and the need for the interchange uh, is, is pretty apparent when you look at the number of trucks that are either on I-75 or using this interchange based on the existing development that's out there today. But it's not just the Federal Highway Administration, GDOT has its own criteria. And since this feasibility study is in coordination with GDOT and the ARC, these four points up here really are the, the meat of most of our uh, feasibility study. And you're looking at minimum spacing of the interchange access as well as the average spacing. So you've got two different ones there. Um, and then you have a land use um, categorization, either urban, suburban, or rural, based on the latest census. And then the last one is it cannot be in the long range transportation plan. The most important, though, is this designation because it actually helps define the first two the urban, suburban, or rural. If we take a look at 1994 out here, you had about 1.8 million square feet of development. You fast forward to today, you're over 20 million square feet. Now what's important about that is when you look at the census, this area is actually listed as rural, even though you got 20 million square feet. The reason being is because the census is based on population. And this doesn't have a population that lives there full time. However, in talking with uh, both the ARC and GDOT, this area is migrating to a urban area. Uh, you've got the urban boundary all around it. It's just a matter of once we get through the next round of census, that will be changed. Therefore, they're going to allow us to categorize this as urban, which is a good thing. So when you start looking at the spacing, remember I talked about that. You got the urban, the rural, and the suburban. You got different levels that you need to look at. And what we're trying to do here is have a minimum of one mile for the urban. And that basically means when you got a crossing interchange to another crossing interchange, it's got to be one mile. Not where the ramps tie in, but where the cross street is and then an average spacing of two miles. And so you can see up here, we sort of did a, an overview of the entire corridor and beyond because we wanted to do some calculations on what the spacing actually works out to be. When you look at the existing interchanges out there between 216 and 212, you can see there's a little over four miles in between the two, which is a good thing. Um, it gives us plenty of room to sort of put where to put this interchange where it needs to be, especially under that urban categorization. Uh, and so what you can see up there is you can see the band that we've got. We've got about two miles in there along 75 where we can place this interchange. Now we ran through some calculations through here because again it's not just the one mile spacing, it's also the average spacing. And based on what we came up with, we're going to meet the uh, average spacing with no problem through there, so we should not have any concerns with that. One of the things that we wanted to look at then is where are there feasible interchanges? What do they look like? Well, we came up with several different options, and I'm gonna flip through these pretty quickly, but what you can see is just a standard diamond interchange. Same diamond interchange, but skewed a little bit more, and pushed up. One of the things that's really important is you want to maintain east-west connectivity, mobility, tying to each side, as well as tying into locations where you maximize the amount of, of uh, traffic that can utilize these interchanges. 
Now these are all schematic. This one's a little bit different, has a, a split interchange configuration, um, but provides for a greater amount of, of mobility, moving traffic in and around the area. You've got the railroad line for Norfolk Southern that we've got to be cognizant of. So as we come across 75, we still may have to be up in the air to clear the railroad track to maintain that 23 foot clearance we need to for them as well. The last one moves the interchange a little bit further south down to Bethlehem Road. Now again, these are all feasible interchanges. We haven't picked one. That's not the purpose of this feasibility study and that's what the guidance provides us with. But you can see this, and our fear with this one though is it's got two things that you need to be cognizant of. If you move it this far south, two things are going to happen. Existing traffic that's up around 216 is likely not going to migrate south to this interchange and then migrate back north again. And then what might happen is then you spur additional development down here. So just be cognizant of that as this process moves forward. Now, next steps. As Rocky talked about, we want to submit the feasibility study to the ARC and to GDOT. We've already had a preliminary review with them. They had some limited comments on it. Uh, some of their internal discussions have been very favorable with their representatives higher up. The next point will be an interchange access request. Um, after they approve the feasibility study, then we go into design and then we go into construction. And with that, I'd like to thank you and answer any questions that you might have. Anybody have any questions or comments? Yes, sir. I yield the floor to District 2. First, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I, I did want to find out because, you know, the, I think stakeholder interest is, is very important. And there's obviously a very big stakeholder that I think initially had some concerns, and that's Norfolk. I mean, how do they, because based upon my analysis of reading through this data, both from the cost effectiveness, options A and B were significantly cheaper. Correct. And then I was happy to see that they also, because, I mean, Everybody, the easiest thing, because sometimes change is hard, and people just say, well, there's already a bridge across Bethlehem. That ought to be the <clears> easiest <throat> route. But nobody thinks about the historic churches, the Correct. cemeteries, the schools, and the crazy wetland areas that we have yes, down there. There's a reason that road curves at, at crazy angles is because they couldn't do stuff. Um, so I, I appreciate you guys putting in and, and finding, because it made me happy to see the A and B were the most cost effective, but also probably had the least impact on some of those historic sites as well as the, the education and school sites. But I want to make sure, because I, I want to have the best chance of this actually having success, we have to have the railroad to be excited about it as sure. well. Did, do they seem in, intrigued and at least interested in exploring this even further? Oh, absolutely. Guys, okay. Absolutely. And of the alternatives that we looked at, um, we were respectful of their Good. property because we know that it's uh, one is a significant stakeholder in the community. They've got a large piece of property. Um, and looking at alternatives A and B, you know, we you sort of see it either, you don't see an interchange in between where A and B are and D. Right. And that's being respectful of that property. Um, they're excited about this. They want to see this move forward as fast as they can. Uh, they, they like to light my phone up about uh, every other month. They'll give that's me a great. call and ask where they're at. Um, they're excited. And, and they want to move this forward as well. I think that, you know, that with each of these, there's some details and some nuances that need to be tweaked. But that comes in with your interchange access request. And how does that occur? And this is really property? for the public's benefit. I think a lot of people, will, you know, you hear interchange. What's the purpose? Everybody, the thing that excites me is if you look where our industrial locations are. I mean, they start at two, they're over at 218, 216, mm -hmm. they go all the way over to 42, which is Kings Mill. Correct. This interchange, I mean, and there's still some tweaks. We could create some type of, of road that connects or cut through over where we could connect the West Ridge and the Greenwood Industrial Parks by, by an interchange, I mean, a light or something. And then there would be Correct. no need for industrial traffic to be on 155 or to be on 42. I mean, these are some of our main arteries in Henry County. And guys, with the ports and some of the expansion that's coming, if we don't address what's going on with all the, the industrial traffic, and, and industrial is good. I don't want anybody to think we're, we're pro-business. We love it, but it'd be nice if we actually had the infrastructure, which, because traffic moves like water, that helped move that traffic 
onto the, 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 the interstate, which is where they're trying to go. So this would be, this would help quality of life as well as I think help us economically tremendously. So when I saw a price tag, I'll, I'll tell you $30 million sound much more affordable than what people originally had told me. Sure. Um, so, and we've already put up a, a, a pretty good chunk. So, and we could probably get some stakeholders to do a special tax district or something like that. So this is, this is some good momentum and I appreciate all your help on this. Absolutely. It's, it's tremendous. Glad to help out. Anybody else have any comment? The only comment I would make was uh, what got me on board with this is when we was looking at ways of trying to get 18 wheelers off our, uh, our local streets. Then uh, looking at an area photo, we, we figured out that it's all right here. This is where they're trying to go, basically. Okay, it, it just stood the reason to us and others in the beginning that if we had an interchange there, we would have less 80,000 pound trucks on our street tearing them up and it would be limited to one area. So uh, anyway, uh, this is, uh, I think this is why the board got on board and we, uh, uh, the citizens through a committee through the Splash Four uh, favored that. And we know that $5 million uh, is just a uh, seed money, but we think enough of it where we, we wanted to progress and try to get GDOT on board and then uh, we'll get you on board then we have to hold hands and get the federal government on board because it's a federal highway. But uh, I think we well on our way to making a good presentation and maybe at the end of the day, uh, the federal government would allow us to, uh, to do this and maybe they might even fund some of it. That would be nice if they would. Absolutely. Yeah. That's our goal. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you very much Thank for you. having me. Thank you. Resolution approving additional funds for utility location and a budget amendment for East Lake Road at State Route number 20. Rocky. Uh, excuse me, uh, Chairman. Uh, there was no vote for the resolution, for the previous resolution. We're going to vote on that. Well, I, didn't, I thought that was a presentation. I'll make that motion. Well, let me look. Wait a minute. Okay, we have a resolution for the Board of Commissioners granting approval of the Henry County. That's not it. That's. Uh, Number three. Okay, that's why I need to look at this. <laughs> I got to get my I got to get my booking sequence. Okay, resolution Henry County Board of Commissioners approving the submittal of a feasibility study for the new interchange Interstate 75 in Henry County to the uh, Georgia Department of Transportation. We have a motion from District Two. Second. Second District One. Any further discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, no. So moved. Thank you. Now, let's move to the resolution approving additional funds of utility relocation. Rocky. Yes, Chairman. Uh, East Lake Road at Stero 20 is an approved uh, District 3 and District 4 plus 4 50 50 cost share project. The board approved construction for the improvements of East Lake Road at Stero 20 as per resolution number 15 147 on May 5th of this year. Henry County Water Authority has a 24 inch sewer force main an 8-inch and a 24-inch water main at this intersection. The relocation cost for the Henry County Water Authority utilities is $343,131.68. Additional funds in the amount of $143,131.68 is needed to cover the Henry County Water relocation cost. Staff recommends using 71000 uh, $565.84 from District 3 daily meal at Walnut Creek that is scheduled for construction in 2018 and $71,565.84 from District 4 from Banks at Rock Quarry that is scheduled to complete September of this year. A budget amendment in the amount of $143,131.68 is needed. Daily meal on Walnut Creek will be reduced from $300,000 to $228,434.16 and banks at Rock Quarry will be reduced from $1,417,000 to $1,345,434.16. Any questions, comment? Yes, sir. District 3. 
Uh, Rock, uh, just to uh, give the public some kind of idea of what we got going on out there at East Lake in 20, could you kind of give us an update? Because I know a lot of people have seen the contractor start work and it's kind of stopped. So would you be happy to do that? Yes, yes, Commissioner. Uh, one of the main issues on, on the intersection and a lot of people can't see is we have this 24-inch uh, force main, the sewer main, and uh, it's, it's fairly deep, but there's a bend on this uh, force main, and uh, also digging could cause this uh, line to erupt, and we don't want that to happen. So we, we're waiting for the water authority to relocate this uh, force main. Uh, one of the issues that we have, that the water authority has, is that they have ordered the material, but certain fittings that they need are on a backlog of about three months. Uh, so we're about three months waiting for them to get the materials to go ahead and get the work. Now, in the meantime, we have done some utility relocations, like the power line, Water Authority is going to go ahead and start relocating the water line, which is on the south side of the intersection. The sewer is on the north side, where we have a hill, uh, where there's a pasture that we got to cut down. So that's kind of been the, the holdup of the project for the construction itself. But utility relocation is ongoing. Uh, charter is uh, relocating as well, and as well as AT&T and the gas. So while we're waiting for getting th these feedings from the Water Authority, the other utilities are relocating as well. Yeah. And Rocky, it's my understanding on this force main, they actually, that force main annual, handles about two million gallons a day. That's correct. It, it, it handles everything on the west side of the interstate. So hitting that line, it would be uh, very dangerous uh, for the safety, not only safety of the traffic, but also for, for the well-being of, of all the citizens that are, live on the west side of the county. Thank you. Everybody else have any comments or questions? If not, we have a resolution approving additional funds for the utility location at, and a budget amendment for East Atlanta Road in State 20. Somebody move in that direction? So have motion. motion District 3. Second. Second District 1. Any further discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. Thank you. So moved. Next, we have a resolution to purchase field sport lighting for North. Ola Park and McDonald using budgeted splash for funds. Rock, uh, correction, Ron. Good morning. Chairman, commissioners, good morning. <clears throat> the Henry County Splash Department is requesting authorization to use splash for funds to purchase field sports lighting for North Ola Park in McDonough, Georgia. Musco Lighting provided a quote of $27,500 to purchase field sports lighting for a new three, four year old T ball field at the North Ola Park. Musco Lighting is the sole source vendor for Henry County Parks and Recreation for field sports lighting and attached to the resolution as a sole source letter and is utilized in numerous Henry County Parks. The Splash Department has budgeted funds for improvements at the North Ola Park, which is SP 4303 in McDonough in the Splash for calendar year 2015. This is for the authorization to expend the funds. If anyone has any questions? Anybody have any questions or comments? I don't have any questions. We have comments. I was down there looking at the field the other day. It looks real good, the work y'all done. I commend you on that. Uh, they've got the fence up and got sawed down, and uh, they got to make a little adjustment on the fence. But uh, uh, it's a big addition there to, to the uh, old association down there, and they're, they're really appreciative of it. Yes, sir. Any further discussion? Uh, somebody move. We have a resolution. Uh, approve a resolution. Of the Board of Commissioners approving the purchase of the field sport lighting for the North Ola Park in McDonald. So move. Have a motion. District three. Second. Second district one. Any further discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. So move. Resolution approving the purchase of security lighting for the Jason T. Harper Arena in McDonald using budgeted splash for funds. Run. The Henry County Splash Department is requesting authorization to use Splash 4 funds to purchase security lighting for the Jason T. Harper Arena in McDonough. Musco Lighting provided a quote of $22,900 to purchase security lighting for the Jason T. Harper Arena. Again, Musco Lighting is the sole source vendor for the Henry County Park and Recreation for the lighting. And again, the sole source letter is attached to the resolution and it's utilized in numerous parks. 
The Splash, the Splash Department has budgeted funds for improvement at the Jason T. Harper Arena, SP 4302, and McDonough in calendar year 2015. This uh, resolution is authorization to expend the funds. If anyone has any questions, I certainly ask. Any questions or comments? I just got one comment. I know I, after having conversations with Tim several times about the park down there, we've had a lot of break-ins and cars and that sort of thing down there. So this is just going to be some added security for that area. Somebody move we approve the resolution of the Board of Commissioners approving this purchase. So move. Have a motion, District Three. Second District 1, in further discussion, all in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign, so move. Thank, Thank you, Ron. Public Safety Resolution approving the exchange and purchase update Universal Facility Extraction Device, a UFED, and software from uh, Celebrate USA. Good morning. Good morning, Major. Mr. Chairman, Board of Commissioners. Um, the resolution requesting uh, approval to exchange and to purchase updated universal forensic extraction device and software from Cellbrite USA for the police department. What this is, serves is this is the device that we use to extract information from a cell phone, including pictures, text messages. So if someone's the victim of a crime via the electronic device, this is the method in which we pull the information off of it and be able to utilize that for further search warrants as well. Um, Henry County Police Department purchased this device back in 2010. Uh, the purchase contract was for a three-year period and included software updates, equipment and software is used to download data evidence from a cell phone or a computer. The data evidence can include history, photographs, videos, text messages, contacts and other information that might be utilized in the prosecution of a case. The information extracted has been very useful in obtaining evidence of crimes for different types of investigations, specifically child crimes as well as crimes against persons. As an electronic technology begins to advance over the years, we have to stay updated with these devices as well. Um, the police department is requesting the approval to exchange our current devices with the host company. And in addition to that, go ahead and engage in a three-year contract with them. This three-year contract will allow us to continue to get updates as cell phones and computers change. So we're trying to get ahead of the curve by doing this. Um, the exchange price for the UFED, which is the device itself, is $5,499.99, and the UFED Touch Logic device, which is $4,499.99. The software updates for one year is $9,296.97. The software renewal for three years is $2,802.45, plus the shipping for the equipment is $170. Cellbrite USO has proposed to us, the police department, a three-year payment plan of $7,423.17 per year which includes all of the before mentioned devices as well as the service agreement. So by going with the proposal of the three year contract, we get everything that I mentioned for $7,423.13 per year for a three year period of time. So in the long run, we're getting updated equipment, updated software, and we're getting the service contract for a three year period. It's our recommendation that we would go with that and the police department obtained a sole source letter from this company as well. No other facility or other operation carries this specific device with this contract. We've coordinated with the uh, Henry County Purchasing Department and they agree that the sole source letter is in place and valid. Recommendation to approve the exchange of the Cellbrite Classic, Ultimate, and Logic devices with software for the new UFED Touch, Ultimate, and Logic devices with software under the th three-year contract plan. Thank you. Anybody have any questions or comment? If not, does somebody uh, move to approve the resolution as published? Move to approve. Have a motion, District 1. Second, Second District 3. Any further discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. So Thank there. you, sirs. Resolution authorizes the purchase of a 2016 T350 
high roof extended uh, leg cargo van from Wade Ford <coughs> for the Henry County Police Department SWAT team. Yes, sir. Major. Good morning again. Henry County Police Department SWAT team currently has a 29-year-old converted bread truck that we use as our SWAT van to transport the SWAT team from various locations. Um, officers have to open the rear doors to the vehicle due to the lack of air conditioning. While the doors are open, fumes from the diesel engine travel back into the passenger compartment causing problems within that area. The vehicle does not have heat during the winter season, uh, not sufficient enough heat to go all the way back into the cargo department. The vehicle does not have, um, sorry, correction. In addition to that, the truck has numerous maintenance issues and has been in, at the Henry County Fleet Services on multiple occasions for everything from it won't crank to it won't continue to be cranked. So this will seriously hamper in their abilities to be able to respond. Henry County Police Department contacted the purchasing department here at Henry County and located the vehicle for a SWAT team. The department has utilized a statewide contract, which is SPD 99999-SPD 0000115 to purchase 2016 T350 high roof extended link cargo van from Wade Ford in Smyrna, Georgia. The specific vehicle, which is in Exhibit 1, and the delivery would be $35,102 and zero cents. Their operational needs and the funding uh, operational need and the funding from fund balance has been identified to replace the current SWAT van. Recommendation would be to purchase this vehicle for a total amount of 35102 no cents. Somebody have any questions, comments? Not, does somebody move the uh, resolution as recited? Somebody move to accept the resolution. We have a motion from District uh, 1. Second. Second, District 2. Any further discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. So moved. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Resolution approving the purchase of two used uh, demonstrator 2013 International Deer Star Type 1 Trauma Hawk amulets by AEV. Chief Johnson, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. This morning we'd like to discuss where you, um, as you know, our, our fleet is aging. Um, in your packet you have, let's see, in your packet you have a list of our rescues or our ambulances and, and how they're aging. A little history of Henry County, we've uh, definitely been putting the bind since 2001 where we went and had a large purchase due to the reactionary need of our apparatus again in 2006 and 2010 was the last time we made a, uh, a large purchase for ambulances. Uh, our fleet's getting older, uh, and we're definitely in, in need of that, uh, both the fire and EMS side. Uh, we're bringing it forward today by working with fleet and trying to f figure a way to, uh, I guess, put a Band-Aid on our, our, our ambulance fleet and looked and found two demo trucks. Um, and we're not alone nationwide with the economy being in a downturn for the last five years everyone's experiencing the same issue. So getting an ambulance quickly is really out of the question. We found these two trucks through our fleet maintenance and uh, we feel that will be a, a, a essential uh, step in, in securing our fleet until we get some new trucks purchased. If you look at our mileage on our trucks um, on, the, on the paper up or on the chart up there, we have an average miles of 172,000 on our in-service ambulances and 196,000 on our reserve ambulances. Um, and we have some of our trucks do 21,000 miles every six months. So if you see a 180,000 mile truck and 21,000 miles every six months, you know, longevity is, we're getting close to the end. And our, our maintenance costs for these trucks are definitely increasing as the mileage is increased on them. So our goal today is to bring forward to you the um, purchase of two demo ambulances. Uh, these are stock units that were moved around the shows for AEV uh, to bring into our fleet and then look forward to working with you on a procurement plan to get our new units. Right now, new units for an ambulance is eight to 10 months once the PO is set. Uh, so looking at a year to get an ambulance built, uh, a new ambulance built, or eight months for a remounted ambulance. Anybody have any comments or questions? I've got a question. Uh, on these trucks that we're purchasing, 
um, have the condition of our ambulances itself that are these high mileage vehicles are they what kind of shape are they in the uh, commissioner Barham up you know our fleet maintenance does a great job the problem we have is older ambulances they they have mechanical when I got here this morning we had two trucks at the shop that came in this morning it was in service they were at the shop getting some kind of repair first thing this morning what that causes the crews have to swap into a spare unit the 200,000 mile unit so we do a lot of swapping out from from the in-service truck to a reserve truck that does bring a hardship but um, I guess condition of our ambulances okay for 186,000 mile truck yeah. and, that, and, and my point is is would we be better off looking at buying a new chassis and a new truck and, and a mountain hour existing ambulances on these trucks versus buying brand new trucks we do that we have two in remount right now we have one, the proposal that, that, that was uh, working with the county manager on is to take the last Ford we have and remount that truck. We do have about a $40,000 uh, savings. We definitely have a remount program. All of our 2010 trucks are remountable, uh, all but two. And we remounted Rescue 7 and Rescue 6 were remounted in 2010. So we bought five new, remounted two. The bigger trucks cannot be remounted. The Chevrolets we have now, the chassis are not made anymore, but are definitely our smaller uh, type one dodges we definitely have a remount pl program in place to make that happen our goal is to keep it in service three years reserve it for two years that should be about 125,000 miles and then remount the box one time do the same thing so every 10 years you would buy a new truck the problem is we're running the 200,000 250,000 we're, we're, we're breaking them down before we get a chance to remount them thank you Yes, sir. This one. Brad, if we purchase these trucks today, how long would it be before they'd be in service? If we had a PO in hand today, we'd probably have eight to ten months. Well, these now, the two, the two we're purchasing today, we're looking at now, they'll take the two demo trucks, we'll give them a PO this week. In two weeks, they'll have them back to the factory, they'll paint them, they'll let them for Henry County, and we have them probably in three to four weeks. In service? In service. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Anybody we did have a few times in the last few weeks that we had to shut down some ambulances. Um, three in one day because of mechanical issues and they're, they're getting old our fleets getting old both fire and and uh, our ambulances we have not replaced anything just with three ambulances in the last five years is all we've replaced anybody else got any comments or questions if not does somebody move to uh, approve the resolution approving the purchase of these two ambulances have a motion district uh, three second district one any further discussion all in favor raise your right hand all opposed same sign so move thank you uh, public works uh, resolution approving a bid award for triple uh, triple surface treatment good morning terry good morning chairman board members residents on fierce drive have requested a dust control measure be placed on uh, the dirt section of uh, fierce drive the project begins at wind drive and continues 0.79 miles until it ties into the existing pavement henry Gannon DOT met with the purchasing department, sent out a bid request for triple surface treatment construction. Uh, this construction has the benefit of not having to scrape when gravel the road is often. Since the scraping is eliminated, the dirt road is, is disturbed less, thus reducing sediment transfer, which improves water quality and helps stormwater with their goals of reducing sediment in streams. So. Seal bids were solicited for the, sip, for the triple surface treatment. Uh, this bid was through the purchasing department. One bid was received. Staff recommends award to Middle Georgia Paving. Incorporated the low bidder in the amount of $68,914.20. Um, funds for this are available in the resurfacing widening surface treatment line item in District 2's PLOS 4 funds. So, and I think be happy to answer any questions. Any question. Somebody moves to approve the resolution approving the bid award for triple service treatment construction of Fair Drive. Move to approve. Have a motion district two. Second. Second district uh, three. Any further discussion? All in favor raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign, so move. You up for the next one too, Mr. McMichael. Next we'll have a resolution approving the notice to proceed on phase two on the contract with uh, Shabnat. Schnabel. How do you pronounce that? 
Schnabel. Schnabel. Dam Engineering for the creation of a special tax district for Category 1 and Category 2 Dam. Good morning. Good morning again, Chairman Board Members. Resolution 1356 awarded a contract to Snobble Engineering Valfreda for the creation of the ordinance for the special tax district for Category 1 and 2 um, dams for the rehabilitation and maintenance. Um, the ordinance uh, would detail out who would be eligible, what would be the boundary of the tax district, establish rate methodologies and structures to apportion cost to parcels in the boundary and the process of how it would take place. This contract was broken up into a phase one and phase two. Uh, phase two would not start until a notice to uh, proceed was given and authorized by the board. Uh, this was set up that way initially in case the board had any questions uh, on the first part or the phase one part. We did bring a presentation to the board on phase one on July 28th. Uh, the decision there was made to proceed on to phase two as originally scoped, so there was no change. Uh, consultant agreed on the original quote of, of $28,620 with a completion date not to exceed 240 days. So this is um, the last phase of this which will create the document or the ordinance uh, to put the special tax dams in, in place if I uh, might add that this portion of it, the second phase of it, has a lot of public input too. So uh, I think that'll be a very important part of the process. Anybody got any questions? Yes, sir. District 5. Terry, will these districts be um, include all the um, subdivisions that have dams, including Swan Lake? Yes, sir. This, this is for any Category 1 or 2 dams that meet the eligibility um, criteria that will be spelled out in it. That will be part of um, the ordinances saying who is eligible to receive or to be a part of that. So it's not for any just one district or any one particular dam. It's for anybody that meets the uh, eligibility requirements. Okay. So it could be, yes, sir. I know you mentioned a couple of phases. Can you walk me through um, phase one and phase two, what those two phases look like? Phase one really um, basically just kind of framed the whole thing. It came up with how, how we're going to do it, for instance, um, first of all, created a special tax district. What should it include? Should it include the whole drainage basin? Should it just include like a uh, homeowners association or a group? Then it looked at possibilities of how you might fund those. So there was some options uh, looked at it at that. Then it was really looked into how, you know, how do you go about setting it up? How do you apportion the cost and the different ways to for the county to reimburse or to recover uh, the monies that they may spend for rehabilitating the dam. Um, so uh, I might add, uh, Wade is here with me this morning. Uh, this is uh, originally this started out of the public works uh, kind of division department, but it's really always been a stormwater issue uh, so wait if you want to add anything to phase one before I go to what we're going to do in phase two no, we, we looked at obviously utilizing stormwater dollars potentially as well and I believe the consensus from the consultants and the group that looked at it like Terry said was to probably move forward with a special tax allocation district for those people that were directly impacted because not only are the dams important to them and property values, but they're also important to us for what we're trying to do with our MS4 permit at Stormwater. They provide great water quality um, and water quality attainment in those areas. So we, Henry County is vitally interested in the, in the overall health and maintenance of those facilities. So, so I, yes, sir. Terry and Ken. Um, there is, I believe, currently around five or so that have been categorized as a category one, which are kind of the critical ones because those are the ones where if the dam fails, there would be risk of life downstream. So I believe there's about five of those identified. Uh, although the el 
eligibility of these is not just limited to the Cat 1 dams. Uh, it is also for Category 2 dams as well um, that, uh, that might be in the same type condition. And you might say, well, why would the county get involved, you know, if it's a, a Category 2 dam, which means it's, um, it's really, if it breaches, it's not a, a threat to life downstream. Well, in a roundabout way, they could possibly be. When they talk about a threat downstream, it's usually houses. They don't consider damage to roadways or any kind of structure like that. Usually, downstream of dams will either have culverts, bridges, things like that, that if these dams, say a Category 2 dam, if it breached, it could take that out. Um, uh, could be some major cost involved in that. So there is, to answer your question, there's five of them that are, I think around five, that are Category 1. That means if the dam breached, there's uh, a threat to life downstream. There's other dams that are significantly large that do not today have that Category 1 status, but I can tell you that there's some dams out there um, that their dams are getting in very bad shape. They're large impoundments, and there would be some, uh, some economic... Uh, it would just cost the county a lot of money and make some real impacts if these things breach. So... I think, just to iterate, I was going over the minutes of the March 2014 meeting where the board approved Phase 1. And I think at that time, four uh, lakes were identified. And I think somebody mentioned that it's 15 out there that uh, possibly could fit in this category as well, too. I just thought I'd throw it in. So you, you just said five. At that and meeting, we only talked about four. We talked about Swan Lake. We talked about uh, Lake Cindy. We talked about uh, uh, Lake Dow uh, State. And we talked about Lake Dow North. I believe, I believe Swan Lake has been reduced to a Category 2, but I think because the two houses that were under threat of breaching have been, that threat's been removed. But I, yes, sir, at the Lake Dow, Lake Dow North, Lake Cindy, there's one on Jonesboro Road, I think that's called Moon Lake, um, and then there's one on um, off of East Atlanta, Bel Air. There's one right on Bel Air that they recently added. Um, that's the five I can name off the top of my head. I think the one on Bel Air has been added since the March 2014 meeting. So you're saying that, to your knowledge, that Swan Lake has now been reduced to uh, uh, Category 2? That is my understanding. Okay. I, I, I was the executive assistant when this was coming down. One of the houses in question that was downstream that would be affected uh, was condemned, and yes, uh, it, it was eventually abated. The second house in question, the county went out and bought the house yes, sir. to eliminate that and had it torn down. So, so that what you're saying is it was reduced from a class one to a class two, yes, based sir. on that. Okay. Only because the threat of life downstream was eliminated, the dam is still in. It's still in need of repair. So Swan Lake is an excellent example of what I was talking about earlier. If it breached, you know, there's a, a bridge there on Old Conyers that's, I think, the major first road crossing below the dam. Uh, there's a good chance that that would just be taken out, I mean, if that, if that dam did breach. So they would, if yes, sir, if they elected to um yes yes so <clears throat> after the tax district is established what percentage of residents would have to support it in order to move the um the uh, district forward in order for the um subdivision to tax themselves that's a great question um which kind of adds to the second part what are we going to do in phase two in phase two of what we're going to do next that's where we start going to the public, going to these different HOAs, get public involvement, 
and establish, you know, exactly what is it going to take for a community to buy in. There's a lot of uh, scenarios you can do in that and how you can get that are done. We have uh, proposed a process that, you know, was in our presentation on on one, but that is some fine tuning and the details that will be spelled out uh, in phase two and then brought to the board and adopted. So at this point in time, Commissioner, that part there is not um, chiseled in stone anywhere. That is something that I think would be worthy of public comment and input Quite simply put, I think the, the way to look at this, this is something to help them. So I feel like they need a, a voice in how this is going to be set up to serve them. If we come up with an ordinance that's not going to be used or not going to be, um, in, it's not wrote in such a way to, to be a benefit of them or won't work, then it really haven't accomplished much. So. That's why I said earlier, I think the phase two is important to get all, finish all the details. We kind of got the framework. We want to finish all the details and then put it in ordinance form. So the result of phase two will be to come back with all of this written clearly out, the process, the steps, everything will be spelled out. Uh, then the board will adopt that as an ordinance. So if a community wants to come up, uh, it even says you're going to fill out this application. Here's what needs to be on the application. Here's the process you go through, and here's the steps that it'll take to accomplish that. Anybody else have any questions or comments? How many Category 2 dams do you think we have in the county? Do you? Oh, I think there's 50 something. It's 50 plus. 60 plus. I mean, a Category 2 dam is, what is it, anything over 10 feet? Anything over 10 feet tall. And, and that 10 feet, obviously, is not necessarily measured from the inside of the dam. The, the, the highest part of your dam is from the top of the dam to the outfall side of the toe of the slope. And that's where it's measured from. So you may have a 6-foot tall dam on the inside, but if it's 12 feet tall from the top of the dam down to the outlet where it touches existing ground, it's classified as a Category 2. I might add one thing too that, and, and I really don't want to cloud the water, but I, I think there's some changes coming down the pike from safe dams. Um, there is some problems with funding for them, and there's rumors and things that say that um, they're going to turn over to the counties the inspection of those dams that they just don't have funding for. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but I guess my point in this is saying there's going to be some changes um, on these dams. Dams are a big problem across the whole state of Georgia. We're not the only county that's experiencing the problems that we're having with dams. This is a, a statewide problem, um, and there's a lot of head scratching going on, you know, internally of how they're going to deal with that. and. And, you know, in the past, if, if you, as y'all noticed, the way to do it is send it down to the local governments and let them fund it. So I don't know, my crystal ball isn't working real well on what's going to happen, but I suspect that, you know, when there's changes, it's usually not good for the, <laughs> for the local government. So I, I'm not predicting gloom and doom, but I'm just saying um, we need to be aware of it's a statewide problem and and they're searching for ways to deal with it as well so i hope they don't send that down to us to solve but anybody else have any comments or questions if not uh, we have a resolution to approve the notice to proceed to phase two on the contract so have a motion to approve second. second district five did you say second Okay, second from District 5. Any further discussion? Yeah, the only just comment I would make is I, I reviewed the tapes and I was not convinced uh, that, that $58,000 would be spent in a wise manner with little or no consequences of getting it back. So uh, uh, I haven't changed my mind. So having said that, anybody else want to discuss and make comments? All in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. All opposed, raise your right hand. So moved. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. County Manager. 
Resolution approving amendment to contract for legal services with Fincher, Denmark, Williams, uh, well, that's a new one, Minifield, uh, Interim County Manager, Sherry Matthews. Good morning, Chair and Board Members. Um, you all should have in your packages an amendment to the Legal Services Agreement for Fincher, Denmark, Williams, and Minifield LLC. Um, as you all will recall, in September of last year, um, the Board entered into two contractual agreements for legal services um, for the county. Um, I will have present the second one to you after we vote on this one. Um, as you all should be aware, there are some changes that we are recommending um, in terms of the agreement that we currently have with FDWM. Um, I'll be more than happy to go over what those changes are, but just a very cursor review as we are looking to amend the scope of services. Um, currently, they do serve as our litigation counsel, but we are adding a statement that they will continue to serve as our litigation counsel, but they will also be assigned um, work through our county attorney. Um, we're hoping that we will have a little more control over what's being assigned to this law firm to ensure that what they're working on, those hours that they're billing, um, is in line with what we think that they should be doing. Um, also, we did make some amendments to the compensation for services. The original agreement just had a rate of $160 per hour for attorney time and $75 for paralegal time. We've also added a um, statement that for services related to the issuance of bonds and or other indebtedness, um, attorneys shall be compensated by payment of a flat fee based upon the size of the bonds issued. Um, and then we've also modified um, paragraph five regarding conflicts. Um, again, the, the language is similar to what was present, but we've also added an added a sentence um, in the event where the county assigns a matter to the attorneys where there exists any potential conflict, the attorney shall immediately notify our county attorney. Um, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Anybody got any questions or comments? If not, we have a resolution approving amendments to the contract for legal services with Fincher, Denmark, et cetera. Somebody move in that direction. We have a motion district five. Second. Second district two. Any further discussion? Uh, just from my uh, point of view, I reviewed the uh, scenario leading up to the uh, outsourcing our law department, and uh, I didn't think it was a good idea last September, so obviously I, I think we uh, probably at the size now where we could uh, – uh, go back and have an uh, in, in-house law department. So having said that, my thoughts have not changed. Does anybody else want any comments? Or if not, all in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. So moved. Resolution approving amendment to contract for legal services with Patrick Jockstetter. Good morning again, Chairman and Board Members. Similar to the previous agreement, again, this is an amendment to an agreement for legal services that's provided by Patrick D. Jockstetter of the law firm Power Jockstetter PC. Um, again, there was um, some amendments made to the previous agreement, most specifically the scope of services. Again, um, the attorney shall serve as general counsel for the county and shall be represent the county and provide such legal services as are reasonable and necessary in such matters. Um, you will also see that under letter, under paragraph one, letter B, additional services, um, the attorney shall review all claims asserted against the county. Where such claims are handled by the county's insurance, attorneys shall issue and monitor the defense thereof. Where such claims are not covered by the county's insurance, the attorney shall assign claims to the county's litigation counsel of Fincher, Denmark, Minifield, and Williams, LLC, and again, shall monitor and assist in such representation. Additionally, the attorney shall review and approve, if appropriate, all invoices for legal services. Um, paragraph three again was deleted in its entirety, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Anybody else have any questions or comment? If not, we have a resolution approving amendment to the contract for legal services with Patrick D. Jogstetter. Is somebody move in that direction? Have a motion, District 5. Second. Second, District 1. Any further discussion? Uh, my thoughts are the same about the county attorney uh, outsource as we would the, the litigation firm so anybody else have any comments or question if not all in favor of the motion raise your right hand all opposed same sign so move thank you thank you sherry approval of the minutes july the 8 2015 uh and july the 21st 2015 if there's no amendments uh, correction to those two minutes uh, i would accept a motion to approve the amendments as published for them two meetings so moved. have a motion district uh, one uh, second, District 3, any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. 
Uh, chairman and Commissioner comments. The Chairman has no comments at this time. Any Commissioner like to be recognized now for any reason? Okay, if not, County Manager, you have any comments? No, sir. Uh, County Attorney, you have any comments? No, sir. Uh, upcoming meetings and events, September the 15th, 6.30 p.m. is a regular meeting, October the 6th, 9 a.m. is a regular meeting. Uh, it is my understanding we need to go into executive session for pending litigation and personnel matters. Uh, so I will need somebody to move uh, into executive session in accordance with the provision of OCGA 50-14-3 and other applicable laws pertinent to the advice of county attorney. And we're going to limit this session to pending litigation and personnel matters unless somebody wants to talk about the acquisition of real estate. Seeing none, if somebody would move that we go into executive session for these two reasons mentioned. So move. Have a motion from District 3. Second. Second District 1, any further discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. Uh, we are now going to executive session in the executive conference room. Uh, we will come out when we get finished. Thank you for attending. <laughs>